out there like to listen to THC together. And one of these couples thought a personal message on one of their favorite podcasts might be a good way to propose. So, <laughs> I bet there are a bunch of couples just looking at each other all over the place right now wondering, is this it? Am I getting engaged right now? But you aren't. Unless your name is Corey Cook, because man, Hannah wants to ask you to marry her. Corey, like perfect synchronicity, you got to do what the Money Bomb winner did and just put a ring on it, my friend. <laughs> A female proposing, I know it's a little break from tradition, but I'm not surprised that THC fans aren't traditional people. So there it is. Monica and Chandler style. I hope it works out. Congrats and all that. Or, you know, I'm sorry. I just don't know. But that said, party people, let's dig in. We know the world is a weird place, full of hidden history, creatures of mystery, and more cover-ups than a Bed Bath & Beyond. Yes! And today we have an amazing California journalist, Nina Hiltner. And she's worked as a reporter for the Press Enterprise of Riverside for 16 years, as well as several other newspapers. She's also a contributor to a website called DC Exposed, where she's written several pieces about some of my favorite themes in this weird conspiratorial world. So without further ado, I give you Nita Hiltner. Nita, welcome to THC. Hi, nice to be here to talk with you about these subjects. Absolutely. I think it's going to be a blast. Thanks for being here. I really enjoy your writing. The topics you cover are great, from the Smithsonian cover-up to modern pterosaurs to sweeping military accidents under the rug and many other conspiratorial things. You know, these are some pretty out-there topics, though, that a lot of people wouldn't dare report on. So let me ask you, how did you get started taking this stuff more seriously? Was there an experience or a specific story or a gateway conspiracy that moved your needle further into the fringe? Well, um, in these particular stories that I wrote, I think what tempted me to begin was my first story on the giant skeletons. And that's because I had been listening to L.A. Marzulli on Coast to Coast Radio about the giant skulls in Peru. And so in looking those up, I actually found a, a newspaper article from 1883 that was about my town that I grew up in, Anderson, Indiana. And I knew that we always had Mound State Park uh, that I was, you know, visited myself as a kid and everything, but nobody ever said that there were any giant skeletons found there. And in this article... It talked about the Smithsonian being interested in making that area a national park because of the finds. And what they found was they broke into an area near the mound that inside were six giant skeletons that were in a sitting position. And when they broke into this, the fresh air got in and most of the skeletons just disintegrated into pieces except for at least two of the skulls. And this article was from the Lima Daily newspaper in, in Lima, Ohio. So I called a friend that I knew worked at the Mounds Park in this day and age. And I said, have you ever heard this story? Because she was like a docent there. And they walked people around and talked to them about the Mounds. And she said no. So to this day and age, they're not even aware that these skeletons existed. And she acted kind of doubtful. But there was this 1883 uh, newspaper article <clears throat> about how one of the historians in, in Anderson had one of the skulls and that another one was on display, which back in those days, as these skeletons were being found mostly in the late 1800s, they would be displayed in the museums all over the country. Hmm. And then they just started disappearing because the Smithsonian would come in and take the bones, you know, telling them that they wanted to investigate them, and they would never be returned. I even read an article that suggested that they had so many of these that they could no longer store them at the Smithsonian, and they would take them on barges out to the uh, Atlantic Ocean and just dump them. Yes, I've heard that too, and that is one of the saddest things, because that you can't get back. No, no. But the theory was that at the time that the reason they didn't want people to, you know, have this written up in history books and all that sort of thing was 
that if it were written up, it would dispute the Darwinian theory of evolution completely. Mm. And uh, that, that they wanted to protect that. I saw that you wrote about that, and I had always wondered, since I've heard this story, why such a cover-up. And when I heard that explanation, I guess for the Times, it might make a lot of sense, but I'm a little surprised that the Darwin lobby would be that strong. Well, it was, and I think, you know, there's theories that uh, it goes back to the ancient elitists that wanted to keep secrets from the rest of us about how this world began and how it was populated and where we all came from. Mm -hmm. And if they are in actuality controlling all that information, then of course it would fit in perfectly. Right. Yeah. I, that's the implication that I think makes the most sense is that there's something far bigger, something older, you know, maybe having to do with our origins, maybe having to do with stories of the Nephilim. It seems like a, a huge can of worms, and this is just a little bit of the evidence to support some of these wilder ideas we hear about now. Right, exactly. I did want to say about that, the Anderson Mounds, I guess it's also oriented to point towards the North Star, is that true? Yes, the entrances to the mounds were all pointed to the North Star. Wow. And so there ha has to be some kind of, uh, you know, scientific part to if these people that were built were called the mound builders, but in reality, if they were who we also call the Nephilim or, you know, the giants that the remains of the skeletons came from, then they were pretty advanced. Yeah. Man, that's, that's so crazy. We see so many old sites all pointing towards celestial bodies, and that seems like it'd be such a hard thing to calculate with the idea we have of where they were technologically. It seems super tough, but it's funny that you grew up next to something like that in Ohio, in the Ohio Valley, Anderson Mounds, because I grew up in St. Louis right near Cahokia Mounds. Oh, yes. And that's another crazy one. Can you tell the people a little bit about that? Well, Cahokia was a city that also is not in our history books for the most part. Kids don't learn about this. But it was a very large city. It had, I believe, 16,000 people there at the time that it existed, and that was the same population as Paris, France, for comparison. Wow. So it was a large trading city that the natives would go to to trade their goods. And what happened was that at some point... It was destroyed, and it was destroyed by fire. And even though n nobody else was putting this together, uh, when I read that after the fire, when it was rebuilt, all of the dwellings were built smaller. And in the uh, Native American histories, they all, it doesn't matter what tribe it is, they all tell the same tale that they fought giants that were man-eaters. Mm and that they had to destroy them because they were eating their people. And if you kind of put two and two together, you can imagine that the Native Americans that we knew were the ones that destroyed this village that was inhabited by these giants because their homes and everything were very much larger than what they were after the fire. So when the Native Americans took over the area as a, their own dwelling place, their homes that they built were smaller. And so underneath uh, that mound, of course, are places that there could be skeletons buried. But there's from the 1990s, I believe, there was a, an act that protects the, the mounds and other places where American Indians were buried. And you're no longer allowed to go in to investigate without their permission. Yeah, it's it's so crazy because when I was growing up, we'd see these things and it, we were always told that they, the, the Indians used to just bury their stuff. Clay pots, arrowheads, dream catchers. It's all really boring stuff. Don't worry about it. We don't know why, but they just like to bury clay stuff. Right. <laughs> it, it, it didn't really make any sense, but we just went with it. We were little kids. We don't think that parents and adults are lying to us, but to think that the, it might be the site of some ancient battle or not even so not even ancient really i guess it doesn't have to be all that long ago but some big battle between native american cultures and races of cannibalistic giants right there near where i was driving around it's pretty interesting right well when l.a marzulli went to peru uh one of the cave paintings that he found was of a being holding a skull and the being was licking the skull which indicated 
man eater. Yeah. And so so it, it is believed that these were carnivorous giants that, you know, looked on the people, the smaller people, as food. <laughs> so um there are many tales that people have indicated of, you know, it's history that we don't read about in our books. One of them was an article titled A Prehistoric Cemetery. It was in a newspaper called The Pioneer. And uh, it wrote that near the junction of the Hart and Missouri Rivers was an ancient 100-acre cemetery hmm. filled with bones of the giant race. It was full of trenches, full of dead bodies, both man and beast. Wow. And in the article, uh, I, I will quote, This has evidently been a grand battlefield where thousands of men have fallen. Nothing like a systematic or intelligent exploration has made as only little holes two or three feet in depth have been dug in some of the mounds, but many parts of the anatomy of man and beast and beautiful specimens of broken pottery and other curiosities have been found. Now, there was one of the most amazing discoveries was of a giant cemetery that was reported in a Fort Wayne, Indiana Sentinel newspaper in 1897, and it reported that there was a prehistoric battlefield with the skulls of 100,000 giant Neanderthals, some with rows uh, with two rows of teeth and others with red hair still attached, all with arrow points in them, and that was found near Wichita, Kansas. So it, that was found near the Choctaw Indian Reservation. Wow. And so when it says 100,000 of these giants were found, can you imagine how many there were in the country at the time? Right. It's it's almost amazing that small tribes of Native Americans would even be able to compete with something that is actually eating them and, and actually so much bigger. Mm -hmm. And so much bigger because most of these <clears throat> were said to be from seven feet to nine feet tall. But all over the world, bones have been found at different heights. I mean, anywhere, you know, over 10 feet tall. It's unbelievable to say that in Peru, the largest one was found 36 feet tall. And in France, the next uh, largest was 25 feet tall. Yeah, 25, 36 feet tall. These, like, that is, that is so wild. And I guess if you think about the story of the Nephilim, if you think about the story of fallen angels breeding with human women and then producing some type of offspring like maybe you can see that something that might be 36 feet tall might have been from the original and then we might have these hybrids that are in the teens i don't know it gets kind of weird but you can kind of see how you'd get there right exactly again it's none of this is any of the history we ever learned as kids so reading about it and taking it in you know it's kind of unbelievable at the beginning but then when you delve into it, you find that these newspaper stories about these uh, giant skeletons were all over the newspapers in the 1800s, and those stories are still there for people to find. Right, yeah, there are ones from the Ohio Valley, California, Illinois, New York, West Virginia, mm -hmm. the, pretty much almost every state. You can find at least one paper from like the 1770s to the 1850s that talks about this kind of stuff. And it just goes to show how easy it is for them to take something that's apparently spreading out to museums all over the country. There's discoveries everywhere. Newspapers are talking about it. And then just say, no, nah, we, we, we want to erase this. And they can just mm -hmm. completely whitewash it, take it out of textbooks, where we, that's the only source of knowledge we really have. And then, you know, it's gone. <laughs> right, it's gone. And I think that's what the Smithsonian wanted because... If there really is a ruling elite that is behind the scenes in everything that's happening in the world, which more and more I'm beginning to believe that because of the things that you hear, you know, you can believe that this was the institution that they used to take care of this. But, of course, this information has been hidden in other countries, so there must be some kind of a determining factor that's decided that we're not going to tell the people what we're finding. And all the people in the 1800s that knew about these skeletons, they're long gone. And if it's not in our history books, mm -hmm. it's gone. For The masses never learn about it right? until this information started coming out. Yeah, and uh, there were also some other weird things about the skeletons I wanted to make sure we talked about. You mentioned that some have 
double rows of teeth. But uh, I believe there are some other things, like uh, some of them have, have had six toes on one foot, I believe. Right. Were there any other strange things? Well, uh, some of them had pr- protuberances from their foreheads, meaning horns. Wow. Uh, so they had horn foreheads, some of them, and most of them were uh, red-haired. When they find the skulls, they find hair on them. And one of the most interesting things that I ever heard from L.A. Marzulli was that when he finally found uh, some of these skulls in Peru in a small museum, they took a sampling of the hair, and for some reason they compared it to some hair that was supposedly taken from a man that had been attacked, he said, by an alien, and he ripped out some hair, and he loaned it to L.A. Marzulli, And they did a specific DNA test on both of the hairs, and they matched. So his feeling was, he said at the time, is that whoever these giants were back then, they still exist, even if another form, and they may still be the ones that have determination over what's happening on Earth. Interesting. Right. It gets really weird. Yeah. There's so many different ways to get deep down into the rabbit hole, but when you find one thread like this, you start tugging on it, and it just brings out all these other possibilities of like, well, if this is a worldwide phenomenon, who's powerful enough to cover this up? Do they have some type of uh, connection to these giants? And then then you're getting really weird, but it doesn't take too many uh, degrees of separation to get to the idea that something's running the planet that might not be completely human or might not be just like you and me. Well, and it might go back to all the stories of Eisenhower meeting with aliens during the time he was in office Mm -hmm. and making a deal with them. Supposedly there's a document making a deal with them to trade technological information for their ability, the aliens, to take people onto their ships and test them, which is a lot of people said that they have been taken. But supposedly the deal was that they were always to give back that person and that person that the alien took was never supposed to remember what had happened to them. But that part of it has kind of gone by the wayside and people are remembering if, you know, if you are to believe that it could all be tied in, Mm -hmm. you know, with who these giants were, if they still exist and if these were the ones that our government has contact with because there's too many stories out there that not just our government, but other governments do have information from other planetary beings about technology and the like. Another aspect to this cover-up outside of the Smithsonian that I wanted to ask you about, because I've heard some other researchers talk about this, and it, it seems to be the case, but it seems like there's a concerted effort to build elaborate things on these areas in some cases, like either build a highway over a mound area or build a shopping mall over it. And some researchers have suggested that it's done purposely so that an excavation of that area is going to be near impossible because you're going to have to tear down whatever they've placed there. And and when you look at these places on these nodes, it makes a strong case that there's that aspect of the cover up too. Have you noticed that at all? Now, I haven't even heard of that one. <laughs> so this is that part of it is new to me. Uh, but, of course, if there were as many of them here, which I actually uh, heard somebody ask how many people were living on the continent of North America when Columbus showed up, and I was shocked to hear the answer. The answer was 47 million. Wow. So, uh, so that's how many Native Americans lived here when Columbus showed up. And before that, you know, so you say, okay, well, if there's 100,000 bodies on one battlefield that they have found, then how many were here? And so all of their sites and everything, they must be all over the place. So whether or not they know a mound is there or not, it must be hard to avoid them in some cases, you know, for, for building. And we don't even treat uh, historic buildings like old McDonald's. We don't treat them well. We tear them down. So, you know, covering up something, it does sound like it could be on purpose, but there must have been a lot of areas left to cover up. 
Yeah, seriously, it has to be huge. When you think about how big this this cover up would be, it makes Roswell look simple. You know, Roswell is just one little ship. You know, that's easy to cover up. Exactly. That was one little incident. Uh, there was uh, a Tuscaroran Indian, David Cusick, that wrote in 1825 uh, about a giant tribe, and I can't even pronounce their names, <laughs> but, it li- but they lived in the Ohio Valley, and he wrote that the other small tribes grew tired of the giants attacking them, so they only took 800 warriors to annihilate all of these giant people, and then David Cusick wrote that after that, there were no more giants anywhere. He wrote that this had happened 2,500 years before Columbus discovered America, about 1,000 BCE. Then the thousands that were killed were laid together in heaps and covered with dirt, which would explain the mound building that was prevalent in the Ohio Valley. They did find giants seated in a circle in a sitting position, but there were also bodies that were just heaped and buried, you know, dirt thrown on top of them because there were so many. Right. When you got these this many bodies and they're the, and they're giants, you can't really dig a hole that big. So they would just throw dirt on top of them. And some of these mounds might just be giant death pits for these giants. Right. Because they were so large. I mean, if you have a hundred thousand bodies, how in the world are you going to bury every one? Yeah. And that David Cusick story is very consistent with the other stories. I think there's another one you wrote about. Uh, James A. Jones was talking about the Lenny Lenape tribe. They have a similar story, I believe. Uh, the Lenny Lenape were the Delaware, basically, that came from Pennsylvania. They went into Ohio. And what's really strange is my maiden name is Anderson, and my whole life I was told that we were descended from Chief William Anderson of the Delawares, who founded Anderson. At that time, it was called Anderson Town, and they were Delaware Indians. And they lived along the banks of the White River, but they lived right where the mounds were. So that showed that the ancient tribes and the more modern tribes would both sometimes, you know, find themselves at the same spots to make their villages. Huh. Wow. So you have a personal interest in all this. Well, it's always been the story that I was told from everybody in my family, but I've not been able to verify it because... Uh, for one thing, if you didn't take money from the government, if you were a Native American, you were not on their rolls, what they called the Indian rolls. And so uh, my grandfather was a farmer, and his land was just on the tip of an Indian reservation where the Delawares were forced to go to when they were forced out of Indiana in the early 1800s. And pictures of him, he's very dark-skinned, so I still have to wonder if that's a true story. It's just so fascinating how many things we have to figure out, so many different aspects, so many cultures have been dominated and their stories go by the wayside. It's a, a seriously sad thing. Well, another another point is that we were never told in the history books that virtually all of the explorers who came to the New World met these giants, saw them, they knew about them. And that was also in South America. Vespucci, Magellan, Coronado, DeSoto, Sir Francis Drake, they all wrote about their encounters with the giants after they left and went back to Europe. Yeah, I saw that in your article too. I was wondering, do do you know any details about these encounters? Because these should be some pretty high-profile people talking about things. Well, I I haven't read any, of course, because uh, how you find that information, it would be difficult because it's so old. But I imagine they pretty much kept their their distance when, when they would see these giants because they were not necessarily friendly. Right. You know, they find a lot of copper jewelry. They did work with jewelry and, you know, just like the Egyptians. A lot of the things that they made were Egyptian like. I mean, very, um, I can't even tell you how detailed it was almost, well, actually, they probably would have had to have had some machinery to do it. I saw one plate that was a square, and it looked like it was four flying saucers in the sky beaming down to the ground, and on the ground was an eye, like the eye that you see with the Egyptian symbols. Mm Mm-hmm. 
And it, all the lines were so precise that the human hand couldn't have done it. So that's all a mystery as to how they would have done that. But I haven't personally read any of the specific encounters with the explorers, but uh, I would imagine it was a little scary to come upon somebody that was proportionally built. And see, it's not just the fact that they may be 9 feet, 10 feet tall. It was that their bodies were as big to match that. So you can imagine what that would have looked like in front of a, a, a five foot or a six foot man. <laughs> right, like the Incredible Hulk. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I imagine they kept their distance and I imagine that there were some incidences where the explorers and their men were attacked, you know. I can't imagine that wouldn't have happened in all the time that they were coming here. But what is surprising is it seems strange that the Native Americans that were being attacked by these giants could have destroyed them. Right. Because they they must have been terrifying to see coming towards you. Right. That is probably the biggest hole in the story for me that I just can't get my head around how they were able to do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess that they just kind of came together to destroy them because, you know, if there were 47 million Native Americans here at the time of Columbus there had to be millions here and not maybe so many of the giants and only in numbers were they able to destroy them I think yeah and maybe I mean do we know much about the giants culture maybe they were like really dim-witted or something maybe they were huge but maybe they had a lot of brawn but not a lot of brights well I think they were pretty smart to create some of these pieces that I've seen Man. Um, I don't believe that they were stupid, but they didn't seem to be peace lovers at all. Yeah. I think that they were, you know, warring tribes and to look down on the Native Americans as nothing but food. Of course, if they were the giants from the olden days and from the Bible, Bible then they considered themselves royalty. And their say and their beliefs would, to them, be primary over anything anybody else that they were around yeah and that would make a lot of sense that they would have this royalty complex this quote-unquote god complex yep so i think that that was part of it that they felt that it was okay to go ahead and kill people for food another interesting aspect of it maybe not connected at all or maybe it is but when i was reading about the stories of giants somebody brought up that the eighth president martin van buren he was 400 pounds and seven feet tall you know that's not far off from what what some of these people are finding no not at all you know <laughs> well you don't you don't know um if any of them bred with the native americans here that's a possibility i mean there are giants on earth today there's some basketball players and people that are seven, eight feet tall. So there's a possibility that that went into the to the genes of some people and came out, and that's what we're seeing. Yeah, a lot of people believe that we were like seeded from the stars, that mankind was developed, and of course the story of the elite from another planet uh, landing on Mount Hermon and using the apes and their own DNA to create man so that they could use them, they think, for mining gold and for other slave labor. So if you think that that's where they came from originally, then you don't know how they departed. Not really. Yeah, you're totally right. They could have just left instead of all being completely wiped out, or they could have gone underground. We hear about uh, beings that live in underground cities or alliances with ET races that take place in, in underground facilities. And there, maybe some did survive. Maybe they're just not walking around. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of little clippings of newspaper articles where giant skeletons were found. It, one of the places that seems funny to me is Brooklyn. <laughs> because you think of Brooklyn as being covered with buildings and everything and but yet they did an excavation and found giant skeletons there so uh thousands were found on catalina island and uh those were measured to be quite tall those were displayed in a museum for a while but no longer and you don't know where those bones went mm -hmm. you know except for all the ones that were gathered up by the smithsonian right and uh 
another one of my personal favorite stories about giants that I've been told is uh, apparently takes place in Death Valley. Some guys discovered an entire underground, what they called an underground city, and uh, they found it, it backed up into some canals, like they had a, a port for ships, and they found some giant skeletons down there with armor on and had some spears and weaponry. And... I would just think, wow, metal armor, that sounds pretty recent. You know, that doesn't sound all super, super ancient. Well, they were able to make, you know, work with metal, that's for sure. And I'm sure, you know, the weapons that they made, of course, would be suited to the size of their body. So you could imagine that maybe a, a normal-sized man wouldn't ever be able to use it for that. They would be too heavy. Right, yeah. That makes it even harder to believe that Native Americans took them out because I'm thinking Native Americans, I don't see them using any type of armor to think that these giants might have been armored up as well. Man. Well, you know, another thing is the timeline of when they were here. There is an article uh, in the New York Times, and it was published July of 1916. And if I can read part of it to you. Sure. It's strange because it says, scientists and earth relics of Indians who lived 700 years ago. Now, they're talking about giants living on this continent only 700 years ago instead of thousands of years ago. It said, Professor A.B. Skinner of the American Indian Museum and other professors who have been conducting researches along the valley of the Susquehanna have uncovered an Indian mound at Tioga Point on the upper portion of Queen Esther's Flats on what is known as the Murray Farm, a short distance from Sayre, Pennsylvania. Okay, in the mound uncovered were found the bones of 68 men, which are believed to have been buried 700 years ago. The average height of these men was 7 feet, while many were much taller. Further evidence of their gigantic size was found in large celts or axes hewed from stone and buried in the grave. On some of the skulls, two inches above the perfectly formed forehead were protuberances of bone. Members of the expedition say that it is the first discovery of its kind on record and a valuable contribution to the history of the early races. The skull and a few bones found in one grave were sent to the American Indian Museum. Now, they're saying it's the first discovery of its kind. Maybe they were related to the protuberances, mm -hmm. but all kinds of these skeletons were being uh, dug up in the late 1800s, and the New York Times knew that because they published the accounts. Yeah, it is just so interesting. You, and you did say that even Asia and Africa have their own giant history that has been discovered and covered up, and so those are probably the two areas where I've heard about it the least. Do we have any details about giants found in Asia? Well, they've been found all over the, the world. In China, they've been found in Africa. In Africa, to, to back up the belief that man was bred as slaves to these giant beings, there were terraces for growing food, food enough to feed all those thousands of slaves that they had to feed while they were mining gold. Uh, there's other people that dispute that we were made to mine gold, but most of them do not dispute the fact that we were developed. You know, we were put together from DNA from those beings from the stars with the giant apes that were here, and that there was this experimentation going on until they found a being that they could control enough to teach to do these chores that they wanted them to do. And so in Africa, you still have the plateaus that were hand-built that were used for growing all the food that it took to feed all of the slaves. It backs it up. It backs the story up. Well, there's a lot that backs it up, and more and more it seems like is being found every day. Uh, things that we, again, were never taught, like there are pyramids in Romania that they're now investigating as, you know, having some sort of uh, electromagnetic powers that probably the pyramids had at one point, or they still do, and we just haven't discovered it. Mm -hmm. But there's, I mean, every day there's something out there new. I try to tell my granddaughter some of these stories, because she's not going to see them in her history books. Right. 
and I think it's important that, you know, we all still stay open to this. There's some people that will, oh, poo-poo, they don't want to hear it because it's too much to try to incorporate into what we've been taught. Mm-hmm. Right. As we're going through these stories, it seems like if a series of successful slave rebellions is at the heart of this history, then that, of course, is something they'd want to cover up. You don't want that history to repeat. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's a fascinating topic, an amazing mystery. Uh, I did want to ask you about some of your other pieces. Was there anything you wanted to add to the, the giant saga before we moved on to some of these other things? Well, unless you want to hear uh, a couple of clippings about when the people did find the skeletons, what they found. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, again, uh, here's proof. The New York Times published a story in July of 1891. <clears throat> it was called Mr. Jefferson's Cyclops. It was a giant skeleton unearthed at Buzzards Bay. And this was Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts. It says... Joseph Jefferson, the actor, has made an astonishing find on the summer place where he purchased here, near that of ex-president Cleveland. In laying out the grounds and making alterations, it became necessary to remove a sand hill of large size. The workmen, while doing this, found the skeleton of a man that filled them with astonishment from its great size. When an attempt was made to lift up the skeleton, it crumbled away all except the skull. A workman lay down by the side of it, however, and it was estimated that it must have belonged to a man at least six foot five or six inches in height. The most peculiar thing was brought to light, however, when the skull was taken to Mr. Jefferson and by him examined. It was like an ordinary skull, only larger, except that it had, as far as could be seen, no place where the eyes had been. There was only one hole in the center of the forehead that might have once served for an eye. This led Mr. Jefferson to believe that he had perhaps discovered the skeleton of a cyclops. He said to Mr. Booth, who was paying him a visit, when he saw the wonderful skull that he and his brother actor had a chance at hand to play Hamlet with a skull, I'm assuming we're talking about John Wilkes Booth, <laughs> such as it had never been played with before. All the scientific gentlemen in the neighborhood have been unable to give an explanation of the skull as were Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Booth. Mr. Jefferson will no doubt be glad to receive suggestions from men of science that may throw light on the matter. Wow. Now, another, another thing that we haven't talked about were about these skulls. Okay, the reason they know that they are not human is because they had a fifth plate. Like human skulls have four plates, but these all had five. Interesting. And the skulls were also elongated in the back, at, you know, supposedly because maybe they had a bigger brain or, or something. And this has been explained by some scientists as just an effect of cradle boarding where uh, the parents would wrap a baby's skull until it was elongated. Mm -hmm. But because of the fact that it has that fifth plate, right. they, they know that these skulls, just most of them grew that way. And so they had not just the fact that they were tall, but they looked different than, than humans. When L.A. Marzulli went to Peru, all of the skulls had the fifth plate. None of them had only four. And therefore, you know, that was part of his evidence that he was dealing with something beyond human. Hmm, that is so interesting. Did you want to read us another one of those clippings? Yes, I just kind of uh, was trying to hold on to those so that I could do that for you. Awesome. There's so many here. Let's <laughs> see if I can... Uh, so many in the Ohio Valley, of course, the Great Mounds in Ohio. Now, here the little newspaper clipping from Anderson, Indiana. Part of it is here. It says, found skeletons eight feet tall. While excavating in a gravel pit at Anderson, Indiana, workmen unearthed half a dozen skeletons, most of which were eight feet tall and over. One in particular was that of a man of giant stature, and all were far above the height of tall persons. Two of the skeletons were those of women. In the graves were found pieces of pottery, such as were unknown by the Indians, which leads to the conclusion that the bones are those of people of prehistoric race. Two bodies were found close to an ancient mound. Wow. Also in Connorsville, Indiana, 
While Sexton Charles Ryman was digging a grave in the city cemetery, he came upon the skeleton of a monster man. It had been buried in a sitting posture with a face to the east and was only about three feet below the surface. The remains indicated that the being of which this was once a part was a veritable giant, probably nine feet in height. The femur bone is about a yard long and the massive underjaw is much larger than that of an ordinary man. It is supposed that the bones were those of the Indian or mound builder. <laughs> so sometimes when the people would find these skulls, they would actually take them and place them over their own heads and the skulls were so large that they fit over the human head completely like a, a hat. Wow, like a helmet? Right. And also the fact that the jaws were considerably wider and, and larger might have had something to do with the fact that it needed to be if they were eating people. I love hearing these stories because they report them so matter-of-factly, like they're not discovering one of the craziest things ever. You know, it was, I mean, there must be thousands of these articles because they're just everywhere. Here's one from February 11th, 1902, the New York Times. Archaeologists to send expedition to explore graveyards in New Mexico where bodies were unearthed. Owing to the discovery of the remains of a race of giants in Guadalupe, New Mexico, antiquarians and archaeologists are preparing an expedition to further explore that region. This determination is based on the excitement that exists among the people of a scope of country near Mesa Rico, where about 200 miles southeast of Las Vegas, where an old burial ground has been discovered that has yielded skeletons of enormous size. Luciana Quintana, on whose ranch the ancient burial plot is located, discovered two stones that bore curious inscriptions, and beneath these were found in shallow ex excavations the bones of a frame that could not have been less than 12 feet in length. The men who opened the graves say the forearm was four feet long and that in a well-preserved jaw, the lower teeth range from the size of a hickory nut to that of the largest walnut in size. <laughs> the chest of the being is reported as having a circumference of seven feet around the chest. <laughs> Quintana, who has uncovered many other burial places, expresses the opinion that perhaps thousands of skeletons of a race of giants long extinct will be found. This supp supposition is based on the traditions handed down from the early Spanish invasion that have detailed knowledge of the existence of a race of giants that inhabited the plains of what is now eastern New Mexico. Indian legends and carvings also in the same section indicate the existence of such a race. So right there it says the Spanish explorers knew about these these giants. Man, yeah. And not only did they have to cover up all the, the bodies, but all their art and culture and tools and pottery, it's all gone. And you wonder where who has that? I mean, since, I mean, copper, copper is so expensive today, many other things all had to do with copper. Their jewelry, their tools, that sort of thing. And... To melt down copper, to, I mean, you just wonder how they did these if they were, if they were not intelligent. And like I said, the the artwork done on some of these was so specific as to be done with a machine. It re they really didn't look possible that they were made just by hand. Yeah, it's like some early form of the Men in Black went around the whole planet and just wiped it all away. Yeah, exactly. Maybe they've existed since long, long ago. Yeah, it's just like, I wonder what else has been covered up. The whole history of man is fabricated. Any any aspect of it can't be trusted when you take a piece this big away. Exactly. And so mm. it throws the light on all of what we've been told in our history books and uh, the ancient history of where man came from and who we really are. And I guess the truest knowledge today would have to just be preserved in the oral traditions of some of these Indian tribes, I would guess, right? And what's strange is they all tell the same story about these giants, all of the tribes, you know, from east to west across the country. They all have the same story about them and how they were destroyed. Hmm. And when we have, like, 
you know, regular Americans, Europeans have almost no oral tradition. I just don't ever hear about that. And here we are. You just told us a story that was came out of a newspaper in 1902. And just a little over 100 years later, everybody would be completely surprised by that. If the Internet didn't come around, these secrets would never be unearthed. I don't think so. I mean, without the Internet having all this information here, other than the fact that I listen to the radio station that does put a lot of the information out there, but if I didn't listen to that one, how would I ever know any of this? And then the Smithsonian does not seem to want to come forward to answer any questions about this. There was one man uh, during the period of time that most of these skeletons were being discovered, and that's because we were pioneers and we were building houses and they were buried so shallow, you know, three feet. You would find the bones at three feet only. Uh, and there was one man that was making the decision what was being done with these bones. Mm -hmm. And most of them were just gathered up. You know, they would come out and pack them away, put them on a train and send them back east. And then from there, most of them disappeared. And and like I said, you know, I read many accounts as to people seeing the bones being loaded onto barges and taking taken out to the Atlantic to be dumped because they simply had no other place to put them. They had so many. They were digging these up left and right. Wisconsin, Minnesota, the entire Ohio Valley, the South. The South wasn't left out of it. And California. I mean, they were everywhere. You know, it was funny because there were tons of museums that were created to display these bones back then. Yeah. But then, you know, they would finally close down because it was old news to people once they went and saw them and they heard about so many others being dug up. From then, when the museums closed, maybe people kept them, kept the bones themselves or thrown away or, again, the Smithsonian coming out and saying, can we please have the bones to do some experimentation on to find out where they came from and all that sort of thing. But then they would never receive their bones back. So all this knowledge went went east. It went to the east coast. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm sure that there will be, like we still find dinosaur bones. I don't think it's too late that we could still find some of these, uh, in today, like you say, in today's age, unless we cover them all up. Right. Well, I mean, I'm I'm sure if we unearthed Cahokia mounds, they'd be right there. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> that to me is like the most obvious case of hidden in plain sight. But this is the thing: through that new law that prevents archaeologists from going into these burial places, we won't get to do that. But the thing is, no in American Indian tribe can claim those bones because these giant bones came from thousands of years before. So that law shouldn't apply, but it is preventing the archaeologists from exploring further. Just like in, in Anderson, Indiana, okay, there might be more giant bones there that they haven't discovered. But because the Delawares came in and stayed in that same area and have burials of their own people there, they would have to ask permission of the Delaware Indians to dig any place there. But who has, you can't ask uh, the giant race because they're no longer here. <laughs> right, right. And if they're buried in the same area, they're protected under this one layer, um, but you're really trying to get to something completely different in the same ground. Right. <sighs> Man. So it all makes it difficult, but it just seems backward, and why Congress passed that, I I just don't know, except for the fact that maybe, like, there's the people out there that don't want this information divulged, because, okay, we're talking about it today, but maybe in 25 years, you know, it'll be buried again, and then it'll take that generation to discover it for themselves. Oh, I totally agree with you. I think that's why... In so many, and, there, and that applies to so many different areas where secrets are being revealed. And that is why the preservation of the free and open internet is the next great fight. Mm -hmm. We're already seeing them trying to creep in and put a lid back on it. But it is the most important thing. Because if they can 
take the wide open internet and reduce it down to your Hulu, your Netflix, your Facebook, your Twitter, and about two dozen sites that everybody kind of uses, well, they've corralled everybody back into their same, their limited channels of information. And we cannot let that happen. No, we can't. We can't at all. But we could talk about the Giants thing forever. I did want to move on because you've written some other great pieces too. And one of them that I want to get to, into is about pterosaurs and the idea of modern pterodactyl-like sightings, which are probably one of my favorite types of things in the cryptozoology realm of all the creatures people are seeing. The idea of flying dinosaur-like things is probably uh, the most far out and wild to me. Um, but tell us a little bit about these things. How likely is it that they're still around? Well, it seems like it's very likely <laughs> because uh, they are being seen. There are certain places that they're being seen more in than others, like Pennsylvania is ripe for sightings of pterosaurs. And I think that mostly that's because it is so forested. But the weirdest one that I have heard was just a, a, maybe four years ago when uh, some people that were on the, the 5 freeway here, which is a very busy freeway in California, yeah. were outside of Los Angeles and... Not just one person driving that day, but at least two people reported seeing a, a flying pterosaur that flew over the freeway. <laughs> and, it, and it flew towards hills that have caves in them. So the belief was that maybe we have something here that we didn't know about before. But they're, they're seen everywhere. They're described the same with the hook on the top of the head, just like we you know, read about the fact they don't have feathers, their wings are leathery, they're very large with a wingspan of sometimes 15, 16 feet. And some people in Kentucky were standing out on their front porch and the road was out in front of their house and they were just standing around talking when one of these creatures flew at a fairly low altitude right past their house and kept going down into the forest. Mm-hmm. And they they don't like flap their wings like they they fly just like we see them in the movies. They glide, you know, with where they'll flap and then glide, flap and then glide. They're also seen over the um, Mississippi. Some people wonder if they're the original bird that was represented by the Native Americans using the Thunderbird symbol. But uh, then there's others that feel that the two two things are different. The Thunderbirds and the Pterodactyls would be two different things. But they're all described the same. So it certainly seems like maybe somehow a few of these have survived past being wiped out during the dinosaur era. Yeah, it's a really fascinating thing. I love that downtown L.A. sighting. I love the fact that it was just in 2013 because so often I'll have a guest and we get talking about cryptozoology and they'll talk about stories from the early 1900s and all things that are long dead for me to experience. And the idea that it was just a couple of years ago, I mean, I live in San Diego. I live two hours from that. <laughs> Well, this has been a real blast. I, I really appreciate your time. Before I let you go, would you like to remind the people where they can read some of these pieces of yours in full or any other information you'd like to give them, maybe contact information? Well, uh, the, uh, the site that the articles are on is uh, DCXposed, D-C 